So, we have a quorum and I declare the meeting open to the public. May I remind members about the pro protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? And can I advise those in the public gallery that mobile devices may be used through a Wi-Fi connection and all devices should be muted? Password details are set out in the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. So, um, apologies. We have not been notified of any apologies today. Has any members? We're Full House. Full House. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chairperson's business. The Deputy Chair and I met with the Minister and Chief Medical Officer on Tuesday, and we agreed to add the coronavirus SL1 to our agenda today, to which we will re return later. We, I also did an interview yesterday with UTV in relation to the financial support for those affected by the infected blood issue and the letter requesting information, further information from the Department that we agreed to send here last week. So I will now refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on 20th of February, which are pages 6 to 10 of the meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes? Content. Are members content? Thank you. And may I advise members that there are no matters arising from the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you. So now, this morning, we are uh, having a briefing from the Allied Health, Professional, Allied Health Professions Federation (NA). Can I advise members that representatives from the Allied Health Professions are here today to brief the committee on current workforce issued in the Allied Health Professions? I refer members to briefing pages at 13 to 34 of the pack and to pages 2 to 38 of the table papers, and there is also an additional paper. Um, so I would like to welcome Mr Jonathan Bull, Chair of the Allied Health Professionals Federation and a member of the British Association of Prothesists and Orthotists, and Ms uh, Leandra Archer, Allied Health Professionals Federation NA and Policy Officer for the Society of Radiographers, and Mr Tom Sullivan, Allied Health Professions Federation and Public Affairs and Policy Manager for the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. So I would like to now invite you to brief the committee, please. Chair, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to, um, for our Allied Health Professions Federation in Northern Ireland to, to come and speak to the committee. Um, I, uh, as, you, as you said, I am Chair of Allied Health Professions Federation in Northern Ireland, but I am also a practising orthodist. Um, I am going to run through a little bit of an overview of, of what uh, Allied Health Professions Federation is, um, who we represent. Um, we will go look through our professions we include um, and I'll give a wee brief overview of our work. Um, Leandra, to, to my right, um, is going to get, um, give a brief overview on, on the workforce reviews. Um, and Tom is going to um, speak about uh, how the workforce reviews can um, assist in tran transformation agenda. Um, Allied Health Professions Federation Northern Ireland um, collectively re represents 12 professional bodies um, covering 13 professions who are registered with the Health and Care Professions Council. The HCPC, for short, ensures that all allied health professions meet a standard of training, professional skills, behaviour and health, and so they are fit for practice. Um, we are the independent voice of allied health professionals in Northern Ireland, as the professional bodies we represent covers um, uniquely all AHPs from all sectors, whether they are um, privately or publicly funded. Um, allied health professionals are a group of autonomous pra practitioners who work with many other professionals at many points along the care pathway. HPs are members of the health and care teams who help support care and treatment and can, can transform people's lives. Uh, we include dietitians, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, orthoptists, physiotherapists, podiatrists, radiographers, paramedics, orthodists and prosthetists, art therapists, drama therapists and music therapists. Um, you should have in your packs um, briefings from most of our 
um, professional bodies or mem member professional bodies. Um, so any practising allied health professional must be registered with the Health and Care Professions Council. Um, in Northern Ireland, there are In the terms of numbers um, registered with HCPC, as of January, we have um, 91 in the arts, um, music, and drama therapies as a collective. Um, dietary have there's 528. Um, um, dietitians 418. Um, orthoptists, 71, um, orthoptists, patient therapists, 1,523, um, physiotherapists, 1,928, um, there's prosthesis of 22, but I think that number includes um, members who are actually working across border, um, they're not actually practicing in Northern Ireland. Um, radiographers, um, 1,273. Speech-language uh, therapists, 762. Um, uh, and that gives around about a total of um, 6,200 um, working within Northern Ireland. Um, off that there we have um, just a little over 5,000 5, would be working in HSC practice. Um, so the Allied Health Professions Federation North Ireland, um, we provide a collective leadership representation on common issues that impact on its 13 member professions. Uh, AHPs are a diverse group of practitioners, each recognised for their autonomy and ability for be innovative in finding solutions to challenges and developing new ways of working, especially within multidisciplinary settings. These are, th these are skills which lend themselves well to the transformation agenda. AHP's role in assessing and treating patients is valuable in assisting and reducing the burden within the medical professions and with direct access being shown to improve treatment outcomes and reduce waiting times. Key aims of Allied Health Professions Federation Northern Ireland are to ensure recognition and contribution to the value of the whole AHP workforce in supporting patient-centred care, um, ensuring that Allied Health Professions are included at a strategic level across the health and social care system uh, and their expertise in health and service delivery is recognised. The purpose um, Well, the purpose of today um, is to um, show the contribution of AHPs and the delivery of delivering together, uh, focus upon more self-care, personal choice, self-referral, HP-led clinics, saving GP time uh, by reducing referrals and signposting to HPs. Um, for example, first contact physiotherapists. Um, the changing demographics of population include complex needs which will require HPs to enable people to remain in their own home longer, for example OTs providing aids and adaptations and thus avoiding possible admissions. Um, the economic argument, HPs are already highly trained at degree level um, and implementation of workforce strategy. Um, so HPF and I um, this year's our so work work plans um, we've become a bit more prominent um, in in terms of um, raising our profile and, and our representative we we are the go-to um, collective as we do represent all um, professional bodies that, that represent AHP, uh, AHPs in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Leandra now for 
Hey, uh, good thank morning. You, I'd firstly like to thank the Chair and Committee for inviting us to represent um, AHPFNI today and talk about workforce issues. As you are well aware, we have, transfer we have a transformation agenda delivering together. And as part of that, the Department of Health um, created, published a workforce strategy in 2018. <coughs> the previous Chief Allied Health Professions Officer, Hazel Winning, instigated a number of AHP workforce reviews covering all the professions. This was very much welcomed by not only AHP FNI, but by also the trade unions and professional bodies. The Federation had been lobbying some time for a workforce plan for AHPs. An AHP workforce steering group was created and workforce reviews for each profession was carried out, utilising a six-step methodology developed by Skills for Health. Within the six steps, each profession defined a plan, mapped service change, defined the required workforce, reviewed workforce availability, and subsequently developed an action plan with key recommendations. Unfortunately, the AHP workforce reviews have stalled since summer 2019, and this could have significant consequences. I have asked the Department why this has happened, and I was told there is no funding in place to progress the recommendations. AHP FNI would advise it is a matter of urgency that the recommendations from each workforce plan are costed and funding allocated to ensure an AHP workforce fit for the future. There are four main themes that transpired across all of the AHP workforce reviews, and I would like to go into some detail in them. Firstly, it was an increase to undergraduate numbers for AHP professions. This will ensure succession planning to meet the known demand for extended and enhanced services to be delivered in Northern Ireland over the next 10 years. Clinical placement opportunities will need to be reviewed to allow for increases in undergraduate numbers in all professions. And we may have to develop different education models to address this. Examples of increase in numbers are in occupational therapy, we are currently commissioned for 50 places per year. This would need to increase by 24 per year. In physiotherapy, it is currently commissioned for 60 places per year. This an additional 36 per year is required. Radiography, diagnostic radiography, we have currently 58 places. We would need to increase this by an extra 50 places per year. And in speech and language, currently sitting at 23, we would need an additional 20 places per year. Overall, the recommendation is to increase the number of AHP undergraduate places from 235 to 406 places per year for the next <coughs> 10 years. At this time, I would also like to inform the committee that the School of Health Science within the University of Ulster is relocating. This process has been going on for a number of years, and the outcome may have a massive effect on undergraduate applications and clinical placement opportunities. It would be advisable that the Health Committee seek a briefing from the School of Health Sciences in relation to this. It is important that the decision as to where the school is based is not made in isolation to AHP workforce issues and delivery of AHP programmes at both undergraduate and postgraduate level. The second theme that transpired across the workforce reviews is in relation to postgraduate training and postgraduate training budgets. As you may be aware, the Department of Health launched an advanced practice framework in 2019. Advanced practice is defined as a role requiring a registered, experienced practitioner to have an acquired and expert knowledge base, complex decision-making skills and clinical competencies for an expanded or extended scope of practice, the characteristics of which are shaped by the context in which the individual works. What is very apparent is that AHPs are uniquely placed to transform services by becoming advanced practitioners and, indeed, consultants. There is much evidence-based practice to support this in England, Scotland and Wales. At the advanced practitioner level, we need further academic qualifications are required at master's level and PhDs for consultants. 
and this underpins knowledge and skills. In relation to postgraduate training, a review is required to assess how it is delivered in Northern Ireland and how we can make delivery more efficient and available. For example, we are sending our radiographers and assistant practitioners across the water to avail of postgraduate training. Unfortunately, over the past number of years, the postgraduate training budget for AHPs has been cut quite significantly. What we need is a three-year budget in place that we will be able to plan and organise training. We need to upskill practitioners in the likes of independent prescribing for podiatry, for physios, for therapy radiographers, for paramedics. The Education Commissioning Group budget, for example, for radiography was 49,000 for all of the five trusts. If we break that down, when you consider that to train one reporting radiographer is £3,500 plus flights and accommodation to England, you would only be able to train <coughs> two reporting radiographers per year. In England, funding has been provided for an extra 300 reporting radiographers. Why do we need this type of advanced practitioner? Because they're one of the solutions in the transformation agenda. A reporting radiographer will report images, decreasing backlogs, decreasing discharge times, de decreasing waiting times, and most importantly, provide the patient with a more efficient uh, service and care. The UK is also experiencing a radiologist shortage. And the RCR, the Royal College of Radiologists, states in the 2019 census that there is an 18% vacancy rate here in Northern Ireland. Reporting radiographers are the answer to this in a more cost-effective way than outsourcing. <coughs> the third theme that transpired was the need to account, take account of work-life balance requests to enable flexible working patterns, to attract people into AHP professions in the HSC. Most of the professions are female dominated, and so work-life balance requests are higher due to childcare responsibilities. In radiography, we have a 90% are or female. Just to finish off, in vacancy rates, vacancy rates among AHPs are high and not, must not be ignored. Safe staffing levels are as important in AHPs as they are in nursing. Any legislation that is introduced must include AHPs, as they do in Scotland. Insufficient numbers of AHPs will cause an inability to scale up services across primary care, including impacts on multidisciplinary teams in primary care. We will not be able to extend services such as seven-day working or 24-hour working, it will increase demands and pressures on diagnostic imaging, therefore impacting on elective care services and waiting times, as well as unscheduled care performance and indeed a viable cancer strategy. Shortages in occupational therapists will have an effect on therapeutic intervention in mental health, settings and re-enablement and increased discharge times from acute settings. In speech and language therapy, where there's currently experiencing a 13.6% vacancy rate, this will create challenges for supporting children with special needs <coughs> and transforming stroke services. Overall, failure to implement the recommendations from the workforce plans will have far-reaching consequences, and if they are not implemented, then this must be risk assessed at the earliest opportunity. What we do not want is another vacancy crisis, as we have seen in nursing, and we must learn from the mistakes that have been made previously. Thank you. Thank you. Alejandra. Thank you. Um, Chair, thank you very much again for the opportunity to be here and to present on behalf of the AHP Federation. Um, I'm going to talk about workforce and how critical the workforce is to the whole transformation agenda. I'll be brief. Um, I suppose, as you are aware, in October 2016, the Department of Health published a 10-year strategy for transforming health and social care, entitled Health and Wellbeing 2026, Delivering Together. This plan was the response to the report produced by an expert panel led by Professor Bengoa, tasked with considering the best configuration of health and social care services in Northern Ireland. Essentially, what Delivering Together states is that change is essential to delivering the world-class health and social care services 
the people of Northern Ireland deserve. The drivers for this change are obvious. Our society is getting older. People are living longer, often with long-term condition. Estimates indicate that by 2039, the population aged 65 and over will have increased by 74 per cent. Similarly, the population aged 85 and over will have increased by 157 per cent over the same period. As the Minister for Health at the time, Michelle O'Neill, stated at the launch of Delivering Together, we must move beyond simply managing illness and instead ensure that our health service supports people to stay well physically, mentally and emotionally. In other words, we need to rethink how we deliver our health and social care service. Delivering Together includes proposals for elective centres, tackling waiting lists and the development of multidisciplinary teams in primary care. All of these proposals taken together are designed to bring about fundamental transformation of the health and social care services. Delivering Together acknowledges that a critical component of this transformation is the development of the workforce strategy to make sure that the health and social care system has the right people to deliver safe, high-quality services now and to meet the challenges of the future. As Delivering Together states, people who work in health and social care are its greatest strength and that the effective workforce engagement and planning are enablers to this transformation. Delivering Together includes proposals for the development of a workforce strategy to cover all aspects of the HSE workforce, including retention and recruitment, opportunities for introducing new job roles, and of reskilling and upskilling initiatives. It stated that this will require investment, but we are convinced that investment in every area of our workforce is critical in delivering this new model of sustainable care. In May 2018, the Department of Health published the Health and Social Care Workforce Strategy, Delivering for Our People. This was a year later than the commitment made in Delivering Together, which had promised the strategy by May 2017. We very much welcome the publication of this workforce strategy, and particularly the assertion in that strategy that said, key to successful innovation and modernisation will be capitalising on the knowledge expertise and professional experience of the AHP workforce, and communicating and sharing good practice, particularly in areas such as public health, diagnostics and reablement. It also acknowledged that there are significant challenges for AHP recruitment, and proposed the development of an advanced practitioner framework, which Leander referred to previously. The advanced practice framework was published in June 2019 to specifically promote the development of advanced practitioner roles mm -hmm. and to underpin the Department of Health AHP workforce reviews. It is also designed to ensure the crucial contribution of AHPs in driving innovation and helping to develop creative solutions to current and future health challenges. It is disappointing, therefore, that despite the references to AHPs playing a fundamental role in the transformation of care, there has been no progress in taking forward the AHP workforce reviews, which were completed in 2019. For example, the physiotherapy workforce review was completed in August 2019, but has, has yet to be agreed by the top management group in the Department of Health. The review recommends that the number of undergraduate training places should increase incrementally from 60 to 89 places by 2022, with the commitment to scope the introduction of an accelerated two-year master's course. However, since then, the AHP Workforce Steering Group has not met and no approval has been given by the Department to implement the recommendations in the review. This will have a serious negative impact on the future of the physiotherapy workforce in Northern Ireland. The Chartered Society of Physiotherapy estimates that the vacancy rate for physiotherapy posts across all trusts is currently running at in excess of 16.6%. And we estimate anecdotally from our, our heads of service that it's probably closer to 20% across all trusts. This is one of the highest of any profession across the health and social care in Northern Ireland and considerably higher than current nursing vacancies. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, Chair, this, if this situation continues, it will have a severe impact on the ability of the profession to maintain services at their current levels, not to mention the ability to deliver the change required to redesign and transform services for the future. 
for example, in relation to the evidence that you received last week from the RCGP and the BMA, they both referred to the success that there has been in introducing first contact physiotherapists into GP practices, and that is starting to have really significant results in reducing referrals to secondary care, reducing referrals for diagnostics, and taking the pressure off GPs. But we need to have the workforce there to be able to continue to enhance that, as is the commitment in the new deal, new approach, where they have a commitment to transformation, but specifically towards enhancing those multidisciplinary teams in primary <coughs> care. But we can only do that if we're going to train the right numbers of staff and have those available to take on those roles. So I'm happy to take any questions and elaborate on some of those points. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for those <coughs> presentations and very, very interesting. I suppose I should declare an interest that when I previously worked as a social worker, it was within a multidisciplinary team, and I have to say I believe I was privileged to work within a very good multidisciplinary team and to see the benefits it can bring. Um, you could you could see where reablement was able to work not only in step down from hospital but actually step up as referred to to prevent hospital admission, which was where some of the best work was done. But I think not only did the service users benefit hugely from all those range of fantastic uh, occupational <coughs> therapists, physios. But everyone within the team actually learnt a little bit about what those what those professions could bring to the overall cure. So I think that's I think that's a, a very beneficial in terms of and and your informative presentations have helped with that. I have two questions. I think the first one probably for Leandra. You'd mentioned there that in order to deliver this, there would need to be a different education model. Could you give us a bit more information on what that is that you're thinking? So we there? may have to look at using different routes of education. Um, they have implemented apprenticeships um, across the water. Um, we may have to look at different ways of providing clinical placements. Um, unfortunately, you are restricted by the number of undergraduate training places that you can provide because there is only a certain amount of clinical placements. Um, so we may have to look beyond the HSC and you know, have clinical placements within the private sector and see if we can, we can do that to increase the number that we have in Northern Ireland. Okay. And would there be any uh, um, benefit in terms of, would, it, would there be any linkage to North-South where you could expand the potential for clinical uh, placements <laughs> or sharing of information? It, it could be reviewed, definitely. Obviously, Brexit will maybe um, create problems regarding that. Um, we have used other clinical placements outside of Northern Ireland in England, um, but obviously we, we want to keep them at home. We want to keep them in Northern Ireland because we don't want them to be um, snapped up by anyone else you know, outside of Northern Ireland. Yeah, thank you. And that actually leads on quite neatly to my second question, because one of the things from, from your presentation, Jonathan, that you'd highlighted that a number of one of the one of the uh, disciplines there was quite a few were from the south or based in the south but, but working here but given the wide the wide range of professions that you represent is there a concern around the recognition of qualifications post brexit and the management of that um, I, I don't see it being a concern um, all um, all of our professions are regulated by the health and care professions council and the HCPC, for short, um, well, they, they essentially validate the, any any courses, and they they also, as Leander was talking about the, the apprenticeship style schemes, um, they're working with any uh, and the apprenticeships in England um, for and um, ensuring that that any sort of course is in line with all the the existing um, degree level. Um, Courses um, that are there at the moment. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I suppose that that is again, again, in terms of uh, th there's potentially maybe scope for some of the colleges, the excellent colleges that we have around the north. I know whenever I went to do my social work degree, it probably was the deciding factor in being able to do it. And rare, rare in a family at the time was that I was able to do the first couple of years in Dungannon. So, mm -hmm. and I spoke recently to a group at a at a an event that uh, we were at there to a group of people who have come through the OU 
and I know that that is opening up doors to people who would struggle otherwise mm. to get through. But I do think a, a bit of imagination, creativity, and providing career progression right through from Dalmas and Cure right into nursing, OT, all those professions is something we do need to, to grasp. So I have a number of indications here. I'll just it will have Paula, then Pam, Alex, Jerry, and Arlea at this point. So Paula, please. Okay, thanks very much, guys. Um, the first question is quite quite straightforward, or maybe it's not your answer. Might not be in terms of. In a lot of the commentary that's relating to the number of vacancies, can you give us an understanding of why there are so many vacancies in, in different parts? Um, well, I, I'll, I'll give you the example of physical therapy <coughs> and, and, and the timeline in relation to that. Um, for example, in 2016, the Department of Health cut the number of training places from 55 to 50 at a time before Ben Goa had made his report in terms of recommending how many people we were going to need to deliver that change. They subsequently restored that to 60 in 2018. The review that we referred to has recommended that eventually that should move to 86 by 2022. That hasn't been done. We currently train 60 physiotherapists. We estimate of those 60 that we train, each year, we'll probably we'll be lucky to get 30 back. The, re the review estimates that we need 89 recruits a year just to stand still, just to deliver the service that we're delivering at the moment. So it, you don't need to be a mathematical genius to work out that we're well short in terms of the numbers that we're producing, but also the numbers that we're able to attract from elsewhere, people who have gone away to train in England, Scotland and Wales and attracting those back. Pay has had an impact on that, um, and the lack of pay parity. I have I received calls uh, on a number of occasions from people from... Um, there was one instance of a woman who was working in Ur. She had been offered a job in Alton Kelvin, and she wanted to come back. Same job would have paid £1,200 less. So obviously that was a consideration and having a pull factor in terms of people wanting to take up those posts. Um, so a combination of things, the lack of not putting enough training places in place in the first place, the pay parity issue which was having a negative impact, we're also um, experiencing more recently competition from health care organisations in the Republic of Ireland who are again looking to attract health care workers and physiotherapists in particular, so there's competition, increased competition there. So all of those factors coming together have created a situation whereby, as I say, we estimate our vacancies will be in excess of 20% for each trust. And secondly, um, whenever there was the announcement that there was going to be the practice-based pharmacists and they, a lot of them moved more attractive, less hours, better paying conditions, and so that was great. And GPs now would tell you um, that they just find them so invaluable and. The workload is still heavy, but it's not quite as heavy. But when you then speak to community pharmacists and say, have you seen any lessening in your workload? And they say, no, not at all. So um, I'm, I'm concerned, or wonder, sorry, comment on whether you think that if we continue to roll out the MDTs in um, uh, GP practices, that that will leave a bigger gap then and, and in terms of the actual the general public health yeah. service. I, I think you're going to have, again, unless you increase the number of uh, people that you're training overall into the service, you will get um, gaps appearing because, to a certain extent, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. A lot of those um, first contact physiotherapists are coming from the trust, coming from secondary care into primary care. So we need to put in place um, measures to ensure that those, there's backfill for those people going into mm -hmm. the community. But, um, so there is, there is an issue there. Um, we currently have about 39 first contact physiotherapists across the whole of Northern Ireland. They're operating in every single trust area and they're starting to produce some really um, positive results. For example, uh, a reduction of 20% in referrals back into secondary car, so they're taking some of the pressure off secondary car, but nevertheless, we're still going to face workforce issues in terms of enhancing and moving those multidisciplinary teams forward and being able to ensure that there's backfill in secondary car for those people 
moving into those roles. But it's the right direction of travel. It's the right thing to do. It's just, again, about numbers at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Pam. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation uh, this morning. And I don't think you need to convince any of us of the, uh, the value of, um, of the allied health professionals. We absolutely see that. Um, Obviously, the, the, the key is um, in, in training and, and having the, the right amount of people in post so that we can help to deliver in terms of transformation. And you mentioned the, the steering group, um, Leandra specifically, and you said that they, uh, they, uh, they've stopped meeting now from a date in... So there is a meeting planned for March, Okay. Um, and that was obviously with a bit of pressure from the AHPs to get the ball rolling again, um, and hopefully you know, it will progress from there, they will be signed up, but signed off, but you know, there needs to be funding allocated for these recommendations. Um, we were here a couple of weeks ago. We heard from the Department of Health's finance team there was £10 million for nursing for safe staffing levels, yet there's no ring fence money for AHPs, which is very concerning. So we need the, those to Okay, and, and, and on the back of that, thank you for that, um, ha, have you an indication of, of how much funding is actually required to meet those key recommendations? I wouldn't, but I would be able to um, get that information for you. I don't at this time believe they've been costed, um, okay. but you could check that with the Department of Health. Okay. I, I would say as well, um, Pam, that the reviews themselves are excellent document. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of work went in yeah. and a lot of cooperation between the professions, our heads of service, the civil servants did a fantastic job. These are really useful documents in terms of the data that they've gathered and the recommendations. But as, as we've said, it's like, having a, it's like having a Formula One car and keeping it in the garage. Mm -hmm. It's only going to be useful if you start to implement those recommendations <coughs> and that's not happening. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Alex. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. I promise to be good. <laughs> to, mm. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned about the amount of places you need for different jobs. Yeah. Has there been any discussions with the department on that? Well, that's, that's part of the workforce plans. Yeah. So that is sitting with the department. And have the you any indications time? from them? We have had some increases in numbers over the past couple of years within radiography and physio as well, um, but these are not anywhere near what we need mm -hmm. to have a workforce fit for the future. Okay, and have you any indication that they intend to improve further? Or? Well, we would hope that they would ring fence funding. Yeah, and implement. I mean, we are already now behind where we should we should have been. Um, we're about you know, we're not, we're not going to make 2020 intake of undergraduates. So it will be the next year. So you know, as as this sits on somebody's desk and not signed off, you know, we're becoming more and more um, at risk of not having the workforce in place. Okay. And you mentioned about three-year budgets. Do you yeah. think that would help improve? Definitely. At the Evans. moment, we have one year budgets in place. Um, it would definitely help with training staff, with organising staff, with getting backfill for staff. I think that's a major problem within the workforce is to ensure that if people are trained, if people go out maternity leave, if they're often sick, that there's backfill there and then. And again, that works into work-life balance element of the workforce reviews. You know, we are recommending in radiography there's peripatetic posts, so that there is a sort of floating bank of group of staff that can backfill immediately. That you're not waiting maybe six months, seven months for somebody to backfill a maternity post, you know, backfill and training. So it's something that has to be taken into account. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alec. Gary? Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. It's very useful. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, can you detail again the 
postgraduate uh, training, um, I think it was a cut in funding, just to elaborate um, what that was in terms of the cut and the effects on it. Uh, again, please. Um, I noticed in the, I think it was the BDEA, uh, the British Dental Association's uh, report, that they said morale was, was pretty much very low. I think 14% said their morale was high or, or very high, so that's what 86% uh, morale not, not great at all, so that's very, very concerning uh, going forward. Uh, and would it be fair um, to say that, you know, you have highlighted these issues and maybe a manifesto of sorts for um, different sort of bodies um, and put them, you have put them, put them to the department, but they've been sitting on their hands essentially uh, for years, going by what you said in terms of the workforce um, steering group not meeting. Um, so would you like to comment on that in terms of the slowness uh, of the department to implement um, some of these uh, proposals that you've, that you've made? Do you want me to take that? Um, in relation to the postgraduate budgets, um, about a year or two ago, there was a, a slash of these budgets. I think it was in relation to 43%. Um, and I can provide you with, I'll get the, the appropriate figures and provide you with them. Um, now, with some lobbying from professional bodies, this was then increased. And I think the, the, the cut then was about 28%. Um, still significant. Uh, and still there is not enough funding in place to provide postgraduate training. Um, we are having to prioritise postgraduate training um, within all the professions. Um, in relation to morale, I think definitely the pay, the new pay deal has definitely helped with morale within uh, the workforce. Um, it should never have taken this long to get where we are, um, and it should have never taken industrial action. Um, to get a pay deal. Um, I, I can speak for the Society of Radiographers. 99.5% of our members that were consulted were in agreement with the pay deal. They were happy. Um, and indeed, this has definitely affected retention and recruitment of the workforce in AHPs. And we will see this, I would say, for a number of years. Um, in relation to the manifesto, Definitely, we have an, an AHPF NI manifesto with our asks, um, and indeed, each profession would have their own manifesto as well, and we can provide them to you. Um, on the other uh, point that you raised, um, Jerry, about why perhaps the department has been slower at times to action some of the these things around workforce, probably part of the reason for that relates to structurally where the, the AHPs are positioned at a strategic level. For example, these workforce reviews will have to be forwarded to the top management group at the department for their approval. The Chief Allied Health Professions Officer isn't part of that top management group, even though they represent collectively the second largest group of healthcare professionals in Northern Ireland. They sit underneath the nursing directorate. But they're not at the top table. And that's replicated in many ways across all of the trusts as well. And that's one of the things that we would like to see reviewed, is a more equi equitable representation for the Chief Officer at that decision-making level. Chair, just quickly, if I can ask, I think it's Leandra, um, in terms of the radiographers, uh, you said there needed to be an increase. Um, could you just quickly detail about uh, if there was an increase, I think it was 20 or so was the number you mentioned, that could sort of help to tackle... 50. 50, OK. How that could help tackle the waiting list and sort of speed up some of the, the waiting times that people are currently uh, um, experiencing? Well, obviously we will have... They will go into the workforce. Therefore, we can then train more advanced practitioners and that's your reporting radiographers, your consultant radiographers. Um, they can decrease discharge times. So a reporting radiographer can give you a report. They don't, it doesn't have to be overseen. They, they work autonomously and can discharge the patient. Um, so you're freeing up, obviously, people coming into A&Es. Um, you're also providing a service a, a, to fill the gap with the radiologist crisis um, and so therefore your uh, you know the backlogs as well will be um, looked at um, in relation to waiting times overall you know we need to transform services 
AHPs are uniquely placed to be able to provide that transformation. Um, and you know, they're, they're a, a vital resource that I, I don't think we're using as much as we should be using. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything in relation to waiting times. I think, as, as was referenced last week by Dr Tom Black from the, the BMA, um, one of the problems that we have is the availability of um, community rehabilitation. Huge issue. And the 12-week waiting list that he was experiencing with one of his patients to get them moved out of hospital, you're going to need to put in place those um, community, re uh, community rehabilitation um, provision in order to get people out of hospital and back into their homes, but also keep them in their home. And that just makes sense. But you can't wait 12 weeks for that. They need that people need that immediately. Um, so that they, you can free up those beds as well, move people back out of hospital where they shouldn't and don't want to be, and back into their own homes where you can you can provide services to them there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, or Leah? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thanks for your presentations. Um, Pam had already touched on the, the funding. I was going to ask a similar question, just to, if there was um, a figure that, that sits with the the um, recommendations from the workforce reviews that would probably be helpful to have so even then you have a, a, a picture of how much it is you need for, for each of the different recommendations and then even if there was a way to even prioritise you know if you were able to focus on one you know in the immediate term which might be maybe the undergraduate training um, you know it might be a, a better way to go at it you know as a sort of quick fix um, so to speak um, but we will certainly ask the department to try and get that breakdown of, of those figures. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's been raised with me before in the past. Um, Tom, you had mentioned about that um, the, the, at the, that group, the decision-making level, that the, the, the allied health professionals don't sit on that, um, on that, that board. And it, it has been brought up to me in the past, and it just seems to me if there's even practical steps like that where you can be filling ga gaps and working together if it is something as simple as you know being a part of that group um to sort of you know to, to have your, your your say in that room because with the multidisciplinary teams they're obviously an important part of transformation you had said yourself they're referenced within the the new decade new approach mm -hmm. and it's really just a question you know maybe it's not happening because you're not part of that 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 decision making group but is there no planning or discussions that's taken place with yourselves formally or informally at the minute in forward planning for the MDTs do you know so if you don't have the numbers at the minute then how can we be planning and transforming the role these MT MDTs out wider you know is there a level of communication that is ongoing with yourselves and and the decision makers? No, there's there would be regular contact with our heads of service and the department and the public health agency as well. who have a sort of commissioning role in taking those um, posts forward. So they're in regular contact around those issues. We've had a we've we've had a sort of graduated um, incremental um, response to putting those in place. We started with the Western Trust, which was first, um, and then. Um, the South Eastern Trust, then West Belfast, and then the last to go was the Southern Trust. So we've we wanted to do it incrementally so that we weren't destabilising workforces in, in some of those other areas. And we 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 identified Western Trust as a priority area uh, in the first instance, which is which is the right thing to do. So we're being sensible about how we're trying to manage this with the cooperation from the department as well. They ha they are having another um, event on the. Um, 25th of March, or sorry, the 1st of April, <coughs> whereby they're going to have a, a session to review where we are at this point in time and what the challenges are to move forward, as you say, to implement and enhance the commitment in New Deal, New Agenda, to further extend that to another 100,000 population by 2021. And that's going, that is going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to look at how we can move perhaps band sevens who are working at that level into band eights to, to allow them to move into those first contact roles and support them in doing that. So there's there's work to be done. There is work being done with our heads of service. So in fairness, there's, there's close cooperation there. Okay. So we're reassured about that. 
seat just quickly, Chair, if I could, um, just in relation to the, the postgraduate training, um, the, the people have to travel to, to Britain to do that. Um, is, there any, um, is there any postgraduate training at that level in the south of Ireland? And, you know, I don't know if you would have any connections. I know you're saying part of the problem is maybe that you're losing people to the south, but is there any way of, you know, working with colleagues in the south to maybe try and get a flow coming up north? Yeah. Do you... oh, both, both yeah. Um, I suppose in in terms of <clears throat> some of the, um, um, some of the professions, even their undergraduate training isn't in North. There isn't any undergraduate training in Northern Ireland. So right. the likes of the smaller professions have have a, a have that bigger challenge. Um, the challenge in in smaller professions is that it's very specialist and very mm. niche. Um, so you need to almost have that centralization um for example process orthos are trained in there's two universities that produce um around about 30 per year each of them so in salford and strathclyde um in terms of postgraduate um training after that um it, typically process orthos would maybe do um training with maybe podiatrists or or sort of Additional training on towards biomechanics or something like that there, mm -hmm. um, so that again isn't in Northern Ireland. It's it's in England. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Lionel, do you want to talk about? Yeah, in relation to radiography um, and especially reporting radiography, it, there is better well-established courses in England, um, because they have implemented this um, for a number of years now. Um, in the south, they have their own workforce problems as well. They have to, you know, deliver postgraduate training and undergraduate training as well, and they are increasing their numbers. Um, but yeah, there is there's absolutely no problem in looking at a north south basis and see what we can come up with. Um, but you know, what we need to think about is how much we are spending in flights, accommodation. Um, time out of work because people have to avail of training across the water. Mm -hmm. It has to be a, a priority. Okay. And indeed, the potential that they would stay and settle. Exactly. And, and that, it's yeah. another concern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Gemma. Just a really quick question. Um, I'm assuming, you know, if the numbers are increased, I'm assuming the demand is there at undergraduate level. You know, that there's an increase, there's a large number of people applying to do the likes of. Physio, and, you know, do you have any idea of what that overspill is with you know, those who have applied and those who turned away? Um, well, I definitely know in, in radiography, so there's 16 places for therapy radiography, mm -hmm. um, and they're always full. Yeah. Um, diagnostic, I think we have 62 in final year at the minute, um, you know, so they're always full yeah. courses. Um, I, I, I couldn't give you the numbers for physiotherapy all the time. I'd get them for you, but it's always oversubscribed. Okay. There, there's never a shortage of applicants for for physiotherapy courses yeah. across in, in every jurisdiction. Well, the worrying thing then about that is if they don't get in here, they'll leave. Um, well, what happens is if they don't get a place here, mm -hmm. they'll go and train in Scotland, Wales, yeah. Northern Ireland. Chances are then they'll get a job there yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and not. Come back, yeah. and, and then we can't. We've lost them. Yeah, and indeed, even career progression opportunities are better elsewhere. So they're saying Northern Ireland, and they're and they're thinking, I'm not going to get my band six or band seven, or indeed, you know, become an advanced practitioner or consultant. And um, so I will stay mm -hmm. in yeah. England. Yeah, and finally, Shamir. Thank you. Um, just in relation to that, the workforce strategy you talk about, I'm just curious to know how far back does it reach? Because there's such a common theme across all the submissions here today in terms of not just um, drawing people into the professions, but there must be a common point where everybody travels up through the educational system and then at some point they all peter off in different directions. So is there, uh, I suppose that STEM would be a common theme perhaps coming up through. Is there a piece where you're actually working with schools and colleges to try and encourage people into the first portal, if you like, um, of taking or considering a career in these professions? And then another reoccurring thing is the 
you know, even when we do get the graduates and if we exhaust everything we have available to us, the retention issue is huge, you know, <coughs> and you did mention the under some creative thoughts about um, getting a clinical placement in private sector. Are there other ideas in the ether floating about about retention that really need to be properly discussed and and worked through? Because I, I do think retention is a huge issue. But those early parts, you know, who are we reaching out to, and when we get them in, how do we keep them there? <coughs> Um, just in relation to the career service, that is part of the workforce strategy um, and it needs to be rolled out. I am not sure of anything that has come from that workforce strategy in relation to radiography. I know the trusts themselves do um, careers events, AHP careers events, which are, are really, really good for mm -hmm. profiling the professions. Um, and indeed, as a professional body, we would attend careers events. Um, in, in Derry and in, in Belfast to try and raise the profile. Um, it's, it's something across all the professions that needs to happen. Yeah, and in, yeah, yeah, just, yeah the, the, the HSC career events only include the trust employed um, HPs as such. Mm -hmm. They don't include um, non-trust uh, employed um, HPs that are contracted or, uh, or otherwise with working within the, the HSC environment. Um, so there's there's probably need for sort of the, the greater inclusion of, of all AHPs into that kind of uh, kind of situation. Um, HPF and I we have got um, we are looking to, towards um, holding or sort of being part of a careers event in in Ten Square in is October I think mm -hmm. we've got a date. Um, so again, we would be pushing forward all all professions that we represent as such, and, and trying to highlight that to um, <coughs> school, school leavers as such. Sorry, just in relation to um, career progression um, and retention of health professionals, what we need is clear career progression opportunities, um, and you know. One of the themes that transpired across the, the workforce reviews was work-life balance requests. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to work differently. Not everybody can work nine to five. Um, you know, people are looking for compressed hours. They're looking for part-time working, um, and we we need to be able to, you know, find a solution within the workforce to grant people's requests because that's why people are leaving the professions because it, you know their work doesn't work for them. Could I just add as well, um, Sinead, that again about retention, one of the ways of, of keeping staff there as well is to is to provide them with those career opportunities and the advanced practice framework so that they can progress. You know, we've sounded sort of very negative, but actually there's a lot of positive things uh, that that are there and the first contact phase is one of them because they really our professions really embrace that. They want to showcase and, and use those skills to their full extent. And they feel a tremendous sense of pride and achievement in doing that. But we need again to implement those advanced practice um, training courses to allow them to, to do that. And that will keep them as well within the service. Thank you. Yeah, I just yeah. say that is reliant on that backflow yeah. of workforce. Postgraduate training yeah. funds. Yeah. And I think it's it's quite striking how much <laughs> these issues overlap with the issues we have already heard about, mm -hmm. but also how much they're impacting on delivery, never mind transformation of services. And in relation to that, just a quick one from me before we wrap up. There was reference earlier to the uh, the steering group, the Allied Health Professional Steering Group, not having met. Now, I understand there will be challenges around finances mm -hmm. in, in moving this forward, but what would the rationale be or what rationale have you been provided with in terms of why that why that work at steering group level wouldn't be continuing apace? It, you know, when I have questioned this, it was funding. Um, for the actual steering group itself, well, no, or the for, steering for group, the, the steering group can come together. It's just for implementing anything from that. And would it would it be your assessment that everything is set in funding ready, therefore, or would it be further? negotiations and planning and strategizing to be done? Well, I think the, the workforce reviews are completed and um, they just need to be signed off and they, they need to be costed. They need to be costed. 
I, I don't believe they have been costed, but you can definitely check that with the department. Okay, and it's timely in that we are meeting, meeting with briefing, the department are briefing us next. So, listen, thank you very much. I think we're all we're all very much aware of the benefit and added value that all these professions bring, and the solutions in terms of transformation. Many of them will will come from from your sector. So, thank you for your briefing, and sure. wish you all the best. Thanks for the opportunity. Right, thanks. Bye -bye. I suggest that we now take a very quick comfort break there, and maybe come back at a quarter to twelve. Yeah. Thank you. Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members. Um, can I now advise you that departmental officials are here today to brief the committee <clears throat> on the workforce strategy. I refer members to the department's briefing papers at pages 36 to 45 of your pack. Can I welcome now Mr. Peter Barber, Mr. Stephen Galway, Mr. Chris Wilkinson, and Mr. Andrew Dawson. All from the Workforce Policy Division, Department of Health. And I would like to invite all of our men, all of our men from the department, to please brief the committee. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I do realise, belatedly, we have a diversity thing going on. Here, <laughs> yes, so, uh, I do think so. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks. I have an opening statement just to cover some of the main issues of that. If you want to. Yep. Go into that. Sure. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much for your time. Um, and I believe uh, we ha you have the briefing note that we submitted uh, last week. So I suppose this is a, a general briefing in relation to the health and social care workforce strategy. And I suppose the first thing I'll say about the health and social care workforce strategy is that health and social care, uh, for these purposes, are lowercase h s and c. So whilst we have our h s c, which is our, our trusts and and our other ALBs of the department, we do also recognise the contribution of the independent voluntary community sectors as well. So the strategy does take account of the contribution there and the contribution that will be required in the future. Um, the, the workforce strategy itself it was published in May 2018. Um, and it was one of the outworkings of, the, of Professor Bengoa's report, uh, Delivering Together. And just to remind ourselves what Professor Bengoa did say about workforce in the report, he said that a large section of the workforce, both clinical and non-clinical, feel disempowered and not properly supported to do their jobs at full capacity. Innovation and quality improvement are subordinate to daily firefighting and crisis management. The acute the current acute model relies heavily on expensive locum and agency staff. The medical workforce can no longer provide the level of 24-7 care required to safely deliver the existing configuration of hospital and primary care. The workforce is still fragmented in silos and divided by administrative and professional boundaries, and there is significant untapped potential in the community and voluntary sectors. So those were all the, that was the backdrop essentially to the development of our strategy, and it was developed following a wide-ranging co-production uh, exercise right across the health and social care sector, and that included uh, our own HSC employers, as well as the independent voluntary community sectors, trade unions, regulators, and other interest groups. The aim of the strategy is that by 2026 we meet our workforce needs and the needs of our workforce. In practice, this means that we not only have to ensure that a reconfigured and transformed health and social care service has the right numbers of appropriately trained staff and the right skills mix, but that the department and employers provide the conditions so that we are an employer and a trainer of choice. And this recognises the facts that our health and social care sector is in competition with other sectors, other regions and other countries to attract, recruit and retain the best people. Uh, and as importantly, our workers should be valued, and that this includes providing the best working conditions to take account, the account of the facts of life in uh, the 2020s. The strategy has three objectives uh, to try and meet the aim, and uh, those are detailed in the briefing paper. But briefly, objective one is that by 2026, our reconfigured system has the optimum number of people in place um, with the best possible combination of skills and expertise. Objective two is that by 2021, health and social care is a fulfilling and rewarding place to work and train, and our people feel valued and supported. And objective three is that by 2019, uh, we have taken steps to improve our business intelligence. The objectives are based around 10 uh, themes. Again, those are identified in the briefing paper, and those very much came out of the co-production and engagement that we had right across the sector in the in, when we were developing the strategy. There are also 24 actions to implement the themes and objectives, and those are listed in, in the briefing paper. Uh, we have made progress in a number of areas. Um, in, in relation to the Action 18 
in the strategy, which is the simplification of employment arrangements and with the first step of looking at the possibility of a single employer. We have started uh, down that road uh, and starting with uh, doctors and dentists in training. NIMDA, the medical and dental training agency, was identified as the single employer entity for doctors and dentists in training. And the first phase of uh, 84 trainees, that was 100 training places, and then taking account of a number of absences due to whatever, for a number of reasons, but those 100 training places went over in phase one in August of 19. There are scheduled to be another 252 Foundation One doctors that go over uh, to this new single employer um, in, uh, on the 1st of, August, sorry, 1st of uh, April this year. And then uh, our intended completion date, which we will miss, uh, was the first of April. Oh, oh, sorry, first of August, 2020, um, and we will miss that. But uh, that is because we've had problems in uh, recruiting an IT uh, project manager to help us uh, to uh, fix the infrastructure there. So uh, whilst we will miss that, there will be further phases going over, and we would be hopeful that the delay will be a matter of months until we can complete the single employer project for doctors and dentists in training. And from that, then we would hope to be learning the lessons. Uh, seeing what issues there were in getting doctors and de dentists in training over and seeing maybe how we might be able to roll that out further. But essentially, the, the reason for it, uh, a single employer is essentially at the moment, if you're a junior doctor, you do six months of a rotation in one trust. If you rotate to another trust, then you essentially are now employed by a new employer. You begin your employment relationship with that employer. You may have to do your generic training again. You may have to go on to an emergency tax code, none of which is designed to be helpful to uh, um, attracting people into working for our system. So that's the main reason it, uh, behind a single employer is to ju just make life easier for uh, the people who, who work there. Um, Moving on to other uh, progress that has been made then, uh, one of the other actions in the strategy is that we want to establish a regional health and social care career service. And this is very much, I think, complementary to what is, is provided currently by schools and by the Department for the Economy. Um, but we want to promote health and social care, not forgetting social care as careers. Uh, and that's going in, I think that the intention is that the career service would go into schools uh, to promote health and social care career service uh, posts and jobs and professions to uh, young people from about the age of 14, 13, 14, so before they've chosen their GCSE subjects and inform them and try and promote health and social care uh, as, as careers. Um, we, we, it would also, I think, be the home for uh, our, uh, our budding apprenticeships uh, policy as well. That would go, uh, would probably live with the career service as well. And we would hope also that that would be the portal by which we could get maybe experienced people who maybe left the service and who would really maybe want to return the service. They, they could hopefully contact the career service and get a, a relatively seamless uh, return back into the service as well. In terms of our education and training commissioning, which is also recognised uh, in the actions to the strategy, we've provided funding for additional training places uh, in the past couple of years for medical specialties, uh, additional pre-reg training places for nurses, midwives and allied health professionals, and we've introduced a new foundation degree in paramedic education as well. And those expansions are, de are detailed in the, in the briefing note, and happy to discuss those in, in the, the follow-up. In addition, we, uh, as a department, uh, commissioned Professor Keith Gardner, the uh, chief executive of our medical and dental training agency and dean of the medical school, to undertake a review, which was published in January 19, which was into uh, what we need in terms of uh, medical school, uh, medical student places in Northern Ireland. And again, that takes quite a, 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 a long view ahead uh, and recommends that we need to expand our supply of funded medical school places from the current 236 a year by at least an additional 100 places a year. Uh, workforce planning is uh, something else that we have covered in the strategy and something I think that we recognise <coughs> needs a much more strategic approach. Again, there are kind of two legs to the workforce planning. This is the day-to-day -day workforce planning that's done uh, by trusts and by ward managers, etc., in hospitals. And then there's the strategic look, which for which the department and, and the PHA and the, the Health and Social Care Board are responsible. 
And again, I, I will fully admit, I think that our approach needs to be much more strategic, uh, and that's what we're trying to do in the strategy in terms of improving that approach to workforce planning. A number of workforce reviews are underway, and increasingly the focus for workforce planning is moving away from individual professions, but onto a multidisciplinary or programme of care approach, which again just reflects the nature of how uh, services uh, are and will be delivered. Uh, we have embarked on a series of, of workforce reviews covering uh, all allied health professions, uh, and this work has been ongoing. Some reviews are in final draft form, others are nearing completion. Um, several have gone through the steering group and secured their endorsements, for example, art therapy, drama therapy, music therapy, physiotherapy, podiatry, prosthesis, and speech and language therapy. We, uh, again, are taking some of those for sign-off to our departmental top management group scheduled for Monday, um, and then the, what will happen is that those findings will, will inform our considerations as to future commissioning, which are decisions that are taken usually around middle uh, or end of March each year. Again, our problem there uh, is that despite the fact that the, the need has been identified in, in these reviews and indeed many, many workforce reviews that have gone on so far, Despite the fact that the need has been identified, sometimes the resource is not available either in its entirety or, or uh, in parts, and therefore a number of workforce reviews have not been fully implemented in the past or have been partially implemented or implemented over a long period of time, which is not what the authors of those workforce reviews originally intended, but that's the facts of, of living with single-year budgets and, and with, with constrained budgets too. We have also commenced a social work workforce review, and we are uh, in the very early stages of starting a mental health programme of care approach workforce review as well. Um, ultimately, the intention of the findings of all of those workforce reviews will contribute to the development of the optimum workforce model, which is envisaged at option five of the strategy. In terms of multidisciplinary and interprofessional working and training, uh, we committed to the exploration of opportunities for the introduction of new roles at Action 8. Uh, please say that the first cohort of uh, physician associates in Northern Ireland graduated from Ulster University in January of 2019. Ten PAs uh, so were secure, secured posts across the HSC. A second cohort of 17 uh, uh, PA students completed their studies in January 2020. Um, 21 applicants, um, some of those from outside Northern Ireland, successfully applied for posts uh, as physician associates within the HSC, uh, and they are due to commence their employment on the 1st of April 2020. Uh, additionally, for, in respect of physician associates, we are supporting a pilot in two GP practices, uh, assisting them to employ physician associates as a proof of concept of their value in primary care. Um, we are looking uh, as, as a, at supporting a minimum of six further cohorts uh, of physician associates as well. Uh, the strategy promised uh, to uh, take account of the effects of the, uh, the then impending EU exit, uh, which has now, of course, uh, occurred. Uh, so, again, as part of the strategy and feeding into that, we established a workforce uh, EU exit subgroup, which comprised Again, regulators, members of trade unions, and employers, just to, at that stage, do the, the contingency planning that was required um, before uh, a deal was achieved. Um, and now that's going to be looking more at the strategic uh, issues as well. And we'll probably now widen out to look at the potential effects of the uh, new, recently published uh, immigration and migration uh, policy as well, and what that means for Northern Ireland health and social care. Um, of course, this is not just about numbers and skills mix in the HSC. It's all about meeting the needs of our workforce too. So we've uh, committed to building on consolidating and promoting health and well-being of our workforce. We've completed an audit of the existing provision that's right across the trust. That's come up with some interesting findings in terms of what gaps exist um, and what good practice exists. And what we want to do now is, is roll some of that out and be uh, let's take a, again a much more strategic and regional approach to the provision of that. Um, what the, the services, the benefits of the service that our workers should get should be uniform across the piece uh, and not dependent, I think, just on, on geography. Finally, then, our objective three was in terms of improving our workforce business intelligence, um, and that, the original date to achieve that was, was December 19. We have done some of it. We have not achieved it all. Uh, in line with Action 22, we did align the HSC staff survey, which was carried out last year, 
um, with uh, some of the um, input in the workforce strategy again, hopefully as a bench, and that will the findings of the, the most recent HSC staff survey will benchmark the views of our staff in relation to a number of things that we hope to address in the workforce strategy, and we would be hopeful, and it's certainly the intention that we would see improvements uh, going forward uh, in relation to that. Um, as work on, uh, on the strategy continues, I mean, we do also have the, the, the rest of the business that attends to, to workforce uh, policy director, which is a terms and conditions, pensions, uh, service um, work, uh, and other work uh, in relation to basically our business as usual as well. But I suppose the two things which are the biggest challenges to the strategy um, are the availability of multi-year funding to allow us to strategically plan. Uh, workforce uh, needs and workforce planning and, and education and training. Uh, it would be much more um, desirable if we were if we were working with multi-year budgets rather than single-year budgets, because after all, these are multi-year training courses, uh, and they, the costs do ramp up over a number of years. Therefore, we probably need better sight of of the, the, the budget in the future to allow us to commission what we require, and that is, of course, in the context of, of the fact that <coughs> even with multi-year budgets. There is competition for, for those budgets as well, not just within the Department of Health, but between departments as well. And that's, I think, a matter of record that uh, our minister and certainly a number of other ministers have, have been in, have made, re those, made those points recently. And the other thing I would mention uh, is the need to reduce our reliance on and spend on agencies and locums. That has got too high, uh, particularly, I suppose, uh, in relation to off-contract arrangements. Uh, and we're, we had a very useful meeting on Monday past with, with employers and trade unions there, just in terms of what steps we can take this year and in a matter of months just to try and start to reduce that and turn that ship around too. Finally, finally, um, just in terms of one of the outworkings of the the agreement to, to get the uh, recent industrial action suspended uh, was the uh, it was a safe staffing agenda as well, uh, which we we and the minister fully support and, and signed up to as a means of of, of suspending the industrial action. And of course, that will uh, have its own workload as well. That will will feed in and hopefully uh, help us to achieve some of our objectives. Uh, but that, again, that's another with a challenge in terms of how we do it and an opportunity as well. So, I'll just end it there. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And I suppose I'll just uh, advise everyone: the acoustics aren't great in here, so if people could just sort of speak up. Um, you'd mentioned the backdrop to all of this, Andrew. And one of the things, a very important piece of that backdrop, was a press release uh, issued a, a, by a report by RQIA in November 2017, where they raised concerns around the impact of nursing shortages. Mm -hmm. So it, that report stated that RQIA considers that. Uh, Concerns. There are concerns relating to the impact of nursing shortages, that that's having an impact on small independent services, such as nursing homes being able to function. They also noted, interestingly, in relation to your last comments there, that there's a reliance on agency nursing staff to fill gaps in nursing. And they went on to say, as a result of our concerns, RQAA has notified the Department of Health of the impact of the shortage of nurses on the provision of health and social care services across the north. So. My question to you is, is, is that not highly unusual? Would you agree that that's unusual for the regulator to issue a statement of that strength? Uh, I'm not over whether just their normal course of events, whether it be unusual or not. It's certainly a matter of huge concern uh, and it was not underestimated or understated in, in the department. So we would say that nursing shortages are not a problem that's unique to Northern Ireland. Um, it is something which is being experienced uh, right across the UK and I think globally. Uh, the, the question is, how do we respond to that? Um, since that notification came out in 17, our nursing uh, and midwifery uh, vacancies and the support grade vacancies for those have just continued to increase. Um, so the problem has actually, in terms of vacancies, uh, just uh, again, it has it has uh, deteriorated further. Again, I think uh, in terms of what we have done to address those, those are, I suppose. Um, the effects and the impacts of, of decisions that were taken in relation to education and training commissioning in the past, uh, and in relation to, I think, the stuff that we're trying to address in the workforce strategy as well, in terms of sustainably commissioning 
uh, training and education uh, in terms of recognising the needs of, of workers as well, I think, uh, and recognising the fact also that uh, the HSC uh, for nurses is in competition with other countries as well. So there, it's a, there's a range of factors which have contributed to that. Uh, the strategy is designed to try and address and alleviate those factors. Um, and again, it's, it is multifactorial. But yes, it's a huge matter, a huge concern. Absolutely. Well, it, that, being, that being so, I find it unusual that, that that hasn't been mentioned once in the delivering for our paper report, which was published just some five or six months later. And that leads me that that leads me to be concerned that the report itself has, in a way, pulled its punches in relation to the the depth and the extent of this crisis in workforce. I would uh, say that it doesn't pull its punches, um, and in fact, there's an entire section at the back, and I was at pains to ensure that this was included, which reflects the findings uh, of individual professions uh, right across uh, health and social care. And certainly, that section doesn't pull its punches in terms of outlining the, the challenges and, and weaknesses and, and issues to be addressed in the system. So we were at pains that this wasn't going to be a everything is fine uh, report that we were it did need to reflect the reality. Um, so I would definitely deny that the, the strategy document itself pulls any punches. Okay, and then. In light of that, then, the acceptance of how, how significant the challenges are, can you please outline the next steps and the expected timeline for the next steps in the process? But also, can you confirm whether the output of the reviews will be specific recommendations as to the numbers and types of staffing levels and training places required to deliver the key transformation agenda? Yeah, that would certainly be the intention. Um, the, the purpose of the workforce review at a strategic level is for the department to be able to determine what, not what our needs are now, but what our needs uh, will be in five or ten years. It needs to be over that kind of time frame. And all of the things that you mentioned uh, in terms of what we need to commission in terms of education and training, that needs to go into the equation. Uh, we need to look at what the attrition rates are. Uh, we need to look at the projected retirement rates, which looks at an analysis of the, the, the age uh, of staff over the next five to ten years. It also, uh, again, uh, looks at uh, the, just basically the, 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 the need to recognise work-life balance, for example, and I think that came up in the previous session. Uh, absolutely, the system needs to recognise the need for work-life balance. That's simply the world we live in. We have a, number, a, a, a huge number of workers who I imagine are not only caring for their own children, but also for their own parents and other dependents as well. That's just a fact of life. The system needs to recognise that. Um, but the, the impact of that on workforce planning is that you, you would need then to increase your headcount within the HSC because you would need more people to cover the shifts that um, essentially w would be left vacant by the need for people to work shorter hours at work, which we entirely recognise is just a fact of life. May I come in, this, Chair, just to that point, explain in terms of the approach to uh, Andrew's outlined the fact that we're looking at not focusing on vacancy management, but looking at the long-term uh, workforce uh, uh, planning, and that is obviously then going to increasingly be aligned to transformation. So it takes into account where we're going. We've, we've been we go the transformation of services, the reconfiguration of services, the opportunities for innovation. Uh, the opportunities for introduction of new skills and mix, mix uh, within the delivery of care. So it is, and it's very much then looking at not just accepting the system as it is, but also how it is going to be evolving and looking at a regional approach as well. So because we have had opportunities to work collectively, for example, I, mean, I know you've had a briefing on allied health professions, but uh, the, the approach that we have taken there has been working collectively with uh, uh, professionals and other stakeholders across the HSC to bring forward their ideas, to look at opportunities, for example, to enhance service delivery and ways of doing things on a regional basis. Uh, and so all of those things feed into the mix that will ultimately then bring forward a range of recommendations that can certainly influence pre-registration training, it can influence routes into the training, it can influence the development of career pathways uh, with, within certain professions. So it all, it, there's a, a, range, a wide range of things. Uh, and I think, as well as Andrew said, we are moving increasingly away from being <coughs> unique professional, just looking at an individual uh, group but looking at delivery of programme of care and how the multidisciplinary teams uh, can be uh, serviced uh, uh, and created to, to, to provide that care. 
And so, for example, uh, one of the areas that we're looking at will be on the line of the cancer strategy. Uh, so, I mean, if you just think about the stages there in terms of, you know, raising awareness, uh, identifying signs, uh, early presentation with symptoms, early access to diagnostic tests, which is obviously important at health professions, treatment plans and the follow-up. Those are all the various steps along that care pathway. You can imagine that all the range of skills that come into play there and the teams of people who are involved in that, and that's increasingly where our workforce planning on a strategic basis is going to, going to take us. But I would also just emphasise the point in terms of, you know, you mentioned that RQI report. Uh, just two, two observations would be, obviously, we have significantly increased our uh, uh, commissioning of pre-registration places by 45 per cent since 2015-16. So we uh, and we are on course in light of the recent decision uh, associated with the Agenda for Change settlement to increase that further. But obviously, it takes a while for those people to come in to, into the system. And the other thing, I think you mentioned that our KI report talks about. Um, it's an interesting area. It gives the, uh, the interplay between the trusts. And, for example, the independent sector, or the, you know, the, well, it could be the, I, I tend to view it as being the interdependent sector, because ultimately we're all working together to deliver care. I think partly what has developed over the last number of years is the fact that we need to work collectively with that sector in terms of understanding their, their needs, because you have individual employers, these could be private organisations who are recruiting their staff. In some sense, there, there has been in times past attention that HSC has been seen as being a more attractive place to work, and people have gravitated towards our trusts, and that's caused pressures in some of the, uh, the, the uh, particularly some rural uh, and other specific locations. But there, I think over the last number of years, there has been an increasing awareness that we need to work collectively as a wider system HSC. We're a small place, we're inter interdependent to, to, to address these evident challenges. Thank you, and I do. We, we do get a sense of lots of activity, but what we need to see is some is action. And in relation to that, I have heard some of the next steps, and I have heard some of the linkages to transformation. I haven't heard anything about timelines. What are the timelines? Okay. So in terms of the the um, the, the additional education and training commissioning, uh, the num the first increase was in 1617, and yeah. that those figures just have now fed through into the last quarterly figures in terms of nursing and midwifery, uh, and there have been increases then um, in the subsequent years, which will then be reflected. Yeah, could, could I just one, say two, I, three, four I, years yeah, from yeah, now. If I say, Andrew, just on that, so the extra 91 places commissioned, they can be available. But, but no, sorry, but, yeah. sorry. In terms of in terms of these reviews that are sitting on yeah. your desk, what are the timeline to action those reviews? Not, not past. What are the timelines for the reviews that you are in possession of now? So the reviews that we are in possession of now are the allied, some of the allied health professional yeah. reviews, mm -hmm. which are going to our top management group on Monday for sign off. Uh, uh, if those are signed off, then the recommendations feed into our commissioning considerations for 2020-21, which take place around the middle or end of March. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I also can say, Chair, we will also have there is a review of the pharmacy workforce. Uh, that, that review is, is coming to a conclusion shortly as well. So the, I mean, there's quite a, a spectrum coming through. But as Andrew said, that we will be looking, for example, there is a review on a medical specialty of microbiology, virology, and infectious diseases. That's con that will also then feed through to the uh, education training budget uh, proposals uh, for, for next year. And Obviously, they are that subject to the availability of, of funding in terms of being able yeah. to deliver on those recommendations. That's a crucial point. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I suppose we, we have heard earlier this morning that in the new decade, new approach, there has been a commitment to ten million for safe staffing in, in, in terms of the party or in terms of the nurses, but that there is zero allocated to allied health professionals. Is that correct? Um, I have to check the detail, but the ten million, as I understand it, was directly in response to the need to fully implement delivering care, which is a nurse-specific um, programme. But do you recognise that there are huge amounts of allied health professionals who will similarly need to be 
factored into the planning? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not just allied yeah. health professionals, all professions. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I have a number of indications in. Um, Deputy Chair there, Pam Cameron first, and then I'm going to Jerry, Paula, Arlia and Sinead. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. We don't underestimate the um, complexity of the, of the issues here. And I fully appreciate it. And the difficulties going forward. Um, you've answered actually some of my questions already around uh, the work-life balance, and that obviously you're you're recognising that uh, because it is really important that you, we don't lose that valuable expertise because they cannot, you know, have accommodation basically and be allowed to continue in whatever that profession would be. So I think it's really important. Um, the series of workforce reviews that were ongoing and we've heard from the allied health professionals um, uh, this morning and um, that uh, the key recommendations are, are there and I hear there's a meeting coming up in, in March. Can, can you tell me, have the, have the key recommendations been costed by the department? Uh, the, the costing is done as so basically the process is that the department considers just whether to accept the recommendations first of all, and then the costing comes slightly later in the process in terms of the, the, the policy paper that goes up to, for, to the decision makers, which I think is now by the minister, uh, just in terms of that, and that will be costed. Yeah. Okay, so we'll presume that the recommendations will be accepted. Um, how long then would, the, would that costing take to actually do? Oh, that can be done really quickly, mm-hmm. but again, it, it's, it is. Uh, presuming that they, they are accepted, etc., um, and they are costed, they can be costed reasonably quickly. Certainly, in time for our considerations for next year. But the crucial, crucial point is, of course, that if once we identify how much it will cost, that's no guarantee that we, we get the money to, yeah. to fund yeah. it. And that's that's our. Yes. That, that's, that's where affordability, affordability comes into play, obviously. Mm-hmm. Can I also just say about the point about work-life balance? I think I should maybe emphasise. We are following a six-step methodology in terms of approach that we apply to all workforce plans. And one of the things that it does is understand the work, as well as the needs of the work, workforce, or what we will need to deliver care, is also to understand workforce supply and to understand the people coming through and what is needed both to attract them in and to retain them. Mm-hmm. So that's actually then a key element that comes out from each of the, you know, the workforce rec- uh, recommendations. You know, so there's not just, there are issues recommendations regarding numbers of pre-reg training, there's recommendations regarding post-reg training, but there's also other issues about how you track people in and how you keep them. And I think that, that to provide assurance that that's very much a focus as to the methodology we use. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry? Thanks for the presentation. Thanks, Chair. Um, two, two questions. Um, I think the latest figures on nursery and mid- midwifery uh, trainee places is 1,025, I think That's it right. is. It was up 25 in last year. Um, do we not me- need much more than that? Uh, and to me, it seems to be that the approach seems a bit slow and a bit unambitious. I think the latest figures in 2017 from Unison say we need 2,500 extra mm-hmm. nurses and I think you said that's one up so it's approximately I think 3,000 nurses needed now. Isn't that an element of the department being slow to respond to this crisis that we'll have and I think we had a briefing previous to yourselves coming in from the AHPs and I had a sense from what they were saying the department seems to be sitting on its hands. There's a very very good list of demands that's needed to um, tackle the OT um, shortages, radiographies and, and a list of others and I just feel that the department isn't responding quickly enough to deal with those uh, uh, th- those issues so I'll, I'll put that uh, to you. Um, the other issue about workforce is uh, neurologists, obviously there's mm-hmm. a big big crisis uh, in neurologists and I think the workforce plan in 2017 uh, stated that 40, uh, 44 neur- neurologists were needed. I think it's 21 at the minute. Uh, I think of those 21, I think eight are over 50 years old. Uh, So that's very, very uh, concerning. Uh, And I think the 2017 plan from the department uh, envisaged 16 consultants in training by 2020. Uh, That's only nine uh, at the minute. So I think there's a big, big problem with neurology. And obviously there's an ongoing inquiry um, going on. And I think in terms of tackling some of the pressures on neurologists Mm -hmm. and to tackle waiting lists, we need to rapidly... uh, 
uh, recruit, train up uh, neurologists. Uh, so I think that's something that I would like uh, some more detail on. And I think uh, trainee doctors are uh, there's 252 of them um, mm -hmm. at a foundational uh, mm -hmm. foundational level, and only two of them uh, are in neurology in terms of mm -hmm. getting experience and getting uh, an idea of, of what's required. So why is that so low? Uh, and just finally, I think the pay parity issue contributed massively to the workforce uh, issues. You know, I was speaking to people who are OTs, nurses, all sorts of ranges of, of healthcare workers, and for them, the, health, uh, the pay parity issue was a major issue for them, and I think it's affected the healthcare service. Um, possibly so. Okay. Uh, okay. Take each of those in turn. Then um, uh, we are we are at an all-time high in terms of commissioned uh, pre-reg nursing and midwifery places of 2025, which I think represents something of a 45 percent increase over the past three or four years. But you're right; it's still our, our vacancies are still, you know, very uh, not what we want to be. Where are we at? We had new vacancy uh, figures published yesterday, covering the the quarter to the 31st of December 2019. Uh, for registered nurses, there was a decrease on quarter, uh, but still, it's still too high. And it's 2,114. Uh, there was also a, a smaller decrease in terms of the number of registered midwifery vacancies that went down from 120 to 93. Still too high. Uh, and worryingly, uh, the increases, there was an increase in vacancies in nursing support from 521 in the quarter to 545, uh, and there was a very small decrease in midwifery support vacancies from 3 to 2. So uh, overall, the number of vacancies in the last quarter went down, uh, but we're certainly not complacent, and we're not saying that this is evidence of a trend of any improvement far from it. We, 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 um, we appreciate any downturn in, in vacancy numbers, but equally, mm -hmm. uh, we're not complacent. So, can um, I just, just emphasise that at the point? Obviously, it takes a long time for people to come through three years training, but by next year, uh, 2021, uh, tra training year, we will have secured an 87 per cent increase in the pre registration training places going through Northern Ireland's universities over the level, albeit the, the, the road that we, we got to in 2015 16. If that gives some assurance uh, to, to, that there is a supply coming through, we are really fortunate in Northern Ireland. We have a lot of people wanting to work as, as nurses and midwives. We would have every uh, commission place at Queen's, we would have eight applicants. Uh, Ulster University would have six, nearly seven applicants. We, so we acknowledge there's a lot of people there who want to get into our system. We also have extremely low uh, attrition out of the programme, and people, I can assure the committee as well, take up posts in Northern Ireland. We undertake a destination survey, as Queen's do, and, the, uh, and also University, uh, a separate methodology, which shows that they have extremely low percentage of people who are not taking up posts as nurses in Northern, in Northern Ireland. So there is a, a supply coming through, uh, which it will take the next couple of years, really, to, to, to make that uh, significant impact. But as Andrea has already pointed out, there are signs that we're beginning to, to make some headway. Uh, just quickly, Chair, I mean, there's a feeling that it's not being done quick enough. You know, I think you're referring to uh, the figures dropping, and there's four or five stats that you quoted, uh, yeah. uh, but it's, there's still two thousand. It's the trend, yes. We, so got to, we got to low. That, it's yeah. not quick enough. People feel, and people are very, very concerned that it's yeah, not being. Yeah. Dealt with rapidly enough. Accept that point, um, and certainly that's why we would try and supplement mm -hmm. the longer-term strategic actions in relation to education and training commissioning with things like international nursing mm -hmm. recruitment as well. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the point just you, you'd made about um, us kind of, uh, the, the progress around uh, OT and radio and uh, radiography and, and allied health professions again. Uh, you're, you're right, there, there are needs there, uh, but there is a finite budget. Last year we were able to increase the number of physiotherapy and radio, radiography places by 10 each in terms of training places uh, last year. still doesn't meet the, the, the projected need and that's accepted, but again we only have so much uh, in terms of resourcing. Uh, and if we do one thing somewhere, we don't do something somewhere else and it's about achieving that balance. We were also able, for example, last year to increase the number of um, clinical psychology places mm -hmm. um, from 11 to 15 
uh, as well. Our ultimate aim to get, is to get to 19, which brings would bring us up to one clinical psychology place for every 100,000 of the population, which is kind of more in line with the rest of the UK. But again, stress the fact that we, uh, there is a balance to be achieved in, in, in where the resourcing goes. Uh, and again, it may be the right call, it may not be. Um, again, people will have their views, but again, it's not a perfect system. In terms of neurology, mm -hmm. uh, there was a workforce review, as you mentioned, completed in May uh, of 2017, and that recommended an expansion of the neurology medical training program by two posts. Uh, one post uh, was funded in 2018-19, and again, there were a number of other medical specialties that were vying for the available resource that year, inclu including urology, radiography, uh, sorry, yeah, radiotherapy. Uh, um, and um, anaesthetics as well. So again, we had to make a balance in relation to that. So we were able to fund one additional uh, neurology post in 2018-19. Um, our, our medical and dental training agency have reported recruitment difficulties in neurology. Uh, currently, five of the 11 funded posts in the current training <coughs> program are vacant, and the department can't extend the program until further recruitment difficulties are relieved. Based on current projections, one trainee is due to complete training in February 2021, four trainees in August 2021, an additional one in August 2020, and two in February 2025. Uh, the neurology training component in, in foundation year two of medical training as well has also been expanded uh, just uh, to try and improve the, 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 the student experience there and hopefully try and, and encourage further people to join the, the training program too. So again, as you say, huge challenges in that specialty, among others, uh, and then we, we, there are measures to, to try and address it, but it is very much we're doing what we can with the available resource and what we have available to us mm -hmm. at the moment. Just a quick question, Chair. Okay, no, I'm going to move on now. I'm going to move on to Paul. I want to give everyone a fair chance, and I do also want to say we are very aware of the context and all of that, and we appreciate the briefing documents that we've got, but we want to focus here on what the strategies and plans are to address it mm -hmm. in terms of our questions and responses, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, in the briefing paper, you talk about the challenges and the need to reduce the reliance and spend on agency and locums and um, starting with off contract arrangements. Um, not that long ago, I was speaking to the chief executive of one of the health trusts, I'll not say which one, but he had indicated that um, there's legislation, or whether it's legislation or regulatory change, but it puts a price cap on the amount that agency staff can be paid, which means then you're not getting it quarter to five on a Friday evening and you're paying all through the roof. It, to what degree do you think that the introduction of that legislation here could help or hinder um, this process? Okay. No, I think, it, right, first of all, again, we all recognise it's a huge challenge. Uh, the introduction of a, of a price cap, I suppose, it would it would be, I suppose, double-edged. So essentially, a price cap at the moment. There, there is, I would say, a de facto price cap in place because we commission or we contract and pro formally procure a number of nursing agencies, and they go through the procurement process. I'm not just talking about nurses, by the way. I'm talking. Oh about yeah, you, absolutely. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, and they, they all go through the procurement process, um, and part of that procurement process is they stipulate what rates okay. they will charge. The problem is. Uh, where the contracted agency um, capacity has has not been enough even to meet demand, and therefore trusts have had to go off contract. So, by its very nature, off contract agencies um, haven't been through the procurement process, and they are the ones that can essentially name their price. Uh, the alternative to engaging off contract agencies would essentially be downturn or temporary closure. Of services, okay. which is not what trusts want to do. They want to avoid that uh, and respect fully that uh, that approach as well. So I suppose if there's a price cap in place, it would it would rule out those emergency mm -hmm. use of agencies. Now that said, probably the off-contract use has has got has gone too far, and that needs to be pulled back, which is why it's the first stage in our intended approach to try and reduce agency and locum use. Thank you. And, and the second question is really about you had mentioned earlier there around 
looking at the workforce in certain sectors and you know looking at the de demography of them and I'm just wondering if you could give us an update on the community dental service review I think the terms of reference went out in October right. I'm just ready to get an update on where that is in terms of meeting and moving forward certainly um, I had a useful meeting with uh, the British Dental Association this day last week where we discussed the community dental review uh, okay. as well so uh, that was I think something we'd agreed to do as part of our, our regular engagements um, and and I had circulated draft terms of reference to the BDA. They'd come back with comments, I think. And then, unfortunately, it, that's where it had sat from November, because, unfortunately, I think most of the vast majority of my time from November until very recently was sort of in preparation for and trying to avoid the industrial action. So I'm behind on a lot of day-to-day yeah. of, of -day issues, including that one. But in the meeting last week, committed anyway to, to fast progress on getting that established. <coughs> I think we are planning a workshop um, in March, April time uh, for community dental. Yeah, we That's have good to the hear. Decisions going forward. Yeah. Okay. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paula. Uh, Arlea. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, thanks very much, Andre, for your presentation. I just wanted to ask a question around um, the mental health workforce review that you mm -hmm. had referred to, and will that include just statutory services, or will that include community mental health services? I'm not sure if you're. You know that at that, this stage, and has there been any engagements or approaches made to the um, the, the mental health um, workforce just around that that review at this at this stage? And then the second thing was in and around um, on page forty one, I think it is action six. Um, let me just see in our pack. It's page seventy eight. Page thirty one. Page thirty one. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's the action six around um, implementing and embedding the regional health and social care workforce planning framework. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, um, is that relating to the 2015 um, planning framework? Has that still to be implemented? Um, I, I'm just thinking if that was 2015 after five years, um, has it not been considered um, more an approach than a target yep, with sure. the, the, the time lag there. Thank you, okay. Andrew. No, thank you. Um, and just in relation to the first point, then we're at very, very early stages of the mental health okay. workforce review, so can't go into the specifics. Um, in a previous life, I, I did look after mental health policy, and I recognise the contribution that the community and voluntary sector plays yeah. here. So I imagine, although I don't want to step on any colleagues' okay. toes, I imagine that would need to be considered. But, but I think I see just to reinforce that point. When it comes to the methodology, we work very closely with stakeholders and all stakeholders in terms of uh, the whole approach to workforce planning. Mm -hmm. It's not so. It's not something being done yes. by some experts or whatever with, from within the department. Absolutely not. Okay. And then in relation to action six, the, the workforce planning framework, mm -hmm. that is, I think, the six-step methodology mm -hmm. yeah. that Peter referred to earlier, which is. Being embedded in everything that we do now, I suppose okay. it was just that was. Uh, I think that action is in there just to keep our feet to the fire, as it yep. were, and make sure that we continue to embed it throughout everything we do on workforce planning. Okay, thank you, yeah. Andrew. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Arlie. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'll keep it brief. I know a lot of those want to come in. Um, I suppose, uh, in looking over the presentation, and thank you for it, and, and the uh, allocated papers, I do. I can't help but wonder at the outset if we're having a bit of difficulty with communications. Um, and I am pleased to hear that the meeting's happening on Monday, for example, um, for the AHP. But is that the steering group? Is Who is that meeting? What? Uh, it's our top management group. So essentially, the steering group clears the, the yeah. findings of, and then they go to our top management group, which is our senior That's the meeting department. on Monday. Yes. Okay. So it, it's just um, information flowing from that, yeah. but you know that people are reassured mm -hmm. that they haven't been forgotten because there are people that maybe aren't at that table that should be, sure. and there's an argument to be made around that. And I just wonder if, if um, thought can be given to communications going forward. So important stakeholders who are going to be the deliverers of these outcomes um, are all involved at every stage mm -hmm. and, and their voice is heard. One of the things, and a lot of focus, and rightly so, has been uh, put towards the encouraging people into the professionals, you know, the, the <coughs> jobs within the sector. And I do notice it was identified as a weakness here um, in terms of those exiting you know, to really capture rich information on why they're exiting, yeah. because there may be very affordable solutions to retaining people that we're missing. And how assured do you feel at this moment in time that we're doing good thorough exit uh, interviews to build strategies around that? 
Okay, thanks for the questions. In terms of the communication with stakeholders, absolutely. We can always do better in communication, uh, and I accept that I think we could have done better uh, in our communication with allied health professionals over the past quarter. Uh, again, I think it was a symptom, unfortunately. Too many things going on, but uh, I take the point entirely. Um, in terms of mm. exiting, um, uh, absolutely, I think there, there is a specific action in the strategy yeah. to rule out exit interviews. Mm -hmm. um, again, that we're, I think, uh, as mentioned earlier, we are behind schedule in relation to that objectives, but it's absolutely something that needs to be done because you're right, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a rich source of intelligence. But, yeah. um, we're, we're finding sort of hot off the press, but I can say, just an update, that you know, we've recently engaged with the Regional Healthier Workplaces Network, who are really representing stakeholders and employers right across HSC, who are very involved, very willing to get involved in taking forward the recommendations there uh, regarding development of a health and wellbeing uh, framework. And part of that actually is, is looking at the whole question of retaining people, people working longer within the HSE and all the issues associated with it, which is possibly part, part, possibly part of what the information that you're, mm. you're might be referring to there about why and encouraging people, enabling people mm -hmm. to choose if they choose to stay longer and work longer in the HSC, because obviously that, that is a valuable resource of mm -hmm. experience uh, to us, which we don't want to easily uh, forego. So that, that, that work is being taken, taken forward there. And can I just also say, on the communication point, absolutely, you know, there's so much going on. I know you've referenced the AHPs, but also to say, you know, dental services, okay. was workforce reviews have been included there, and pharmacy, which is a very significant area, and you'll be aware of the challenges associated with that. So, it's, so it is, I think, a challenge. I think we are really pleased now having the executive in place, having the minister to help as well take, take that forward. It will help we inject momentum into all of this and focus into all of this, which we greatly welcome. Mm. I appreciate that comment because I think there are many, even outside of this room, who are vested stakeholders who perhaps are feeling outside of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just make one further point just in relation to stakeholders? We, do, we have established uh, and this will be a long-term uh, endeavour, uh, a reference group uh, for the workforce strategy, which has very wide uh, representation on it. They will see early drafts of things as they're being uh, developed. They'll have an opportunity to comment and feed in and co-develop and co-produce the, 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 the policies and, and actions that we'll do as well. So that will, uh, that will give them a good opportunity just to get a huge range of, of interests uh, represented. How, how do you get appointed to the reference group? Uh, essentially, uh, it started, the reference group started off uh, as uh, all of the membership of the steering group that produced the strategy, but as we've gone on in terms of the, the days of implementation, implementation uh, of the strategy, we meet various people and we offer them a place on the reference group and we say to them, you know, say to anybody in your sector, they, if they want to be on the reference group, they can. So I suppose uh, today is the opportunity for it to go to a wider audience too, if you want to be on the, the <laughs> reference group. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. And Gemma, finally. Thank you. Um, you said that objective three hasn't been completed. Um, why not? And then I have another question um, around the EU exit group. Sure. Um, it's been meeting since 2018. So when or have they already um, reported and what's the terms of reference for the Okay. Um, on objective three, why haven't we uh, completed it? Um, we, we, there are four actions mm -hmm. under objective three. We've done one. Others, essentially, again, it has just been a mixture of um, time, days, hours in the day of being able to address those issues. Um, and uh, essentially, also, um, I think I am a bit behind schedule in terms of just doing the, the gap analysis at the moment. What exactly do we need to, to look at? So essentially, hands on the table. It is as simple as that. It's just a matter of resourcing. Okay. Um, so that, that's the reason why. Um, in terms then um, of the, the e-exit um, subgroup, uh, again, it's, it's not so, it wasn't so much tasked with producing a product rather than uh, providing, giving us real-time intelligence and input into the effects in various sectors on the ground. Uh, of, of the EU exit uh, potentials, etc. We also, I think, uh, and they were, it was extremely valuable just to get, to get their insights in terms of uh, the potential impacts on numbers. Mm. They, they were uh, very helpful in rolling and in getting our communications out in relation to our, our work with the Home Office on the EU settlement scheme. 
Um, so that, that it was uh, those were very useful in terms of just getting the communications out to various sectors as well, which we would maybe have had trouble with without them. Okay. On the terms of reference? Um, not off the top of my head, but I can certainly yeah. get those to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, in, in relation to social work, the 2012 strategy referenced the difficulties around bureaucracy and, and increasing bureaucracies with social work. <coughs> it's also been referenced in the 2018 strategy, and we, many of us will have spoken to Baswa, and indeed this has been raised in other significant reports. Can you give us an update on what's being done to deal with that? Sure. Um, I co-chair, along with uh, my colleague Christine Smith, um, the the work, sorry, the social work workforce strategy um, group. Uh, so it is currently in, uh, in in the process of developing a, a social work workforce strategy for the future. There is a workshop tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I'll be opening and attending, uh, with a huge range of stakeholders from across social work, just in terms of identifying the needs uh, for that sector. Um, but in terms of the bureaucracy, that is a point very well made uh, in social work and, uh, in fact, beyond the system as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a point that has been made by NIPSA uh, colleagues around the table on the social work uh, workforce review as well. Part of the, I suppose, outworkings of uh, the, the uh, framework agreement to end the industrial action, we did, I think, say, you know, this is there are uh, problems in nurse retention and recruitment, AHP retention and recruitment, social work, etc. There are also issues in uh, our admin and clerical mm -hmm. um, as well. Uh, I think admin and clerical has uh, a high number of vacancies, uh, and that's not to be underestimated. The, the effect of that uh, on in terms of what then that in turn uh, requires professionals to do in terms of the admin and clerical. So. There are a lot of moving parts uh, to this, but the point about bureaucracy is very well made. I suppose the other thing to say as well, uh, and again, not coming from a, a social work specialist point of view, but the, the role of social workers, as indeed the role of others, is, is always evolving and changing. Uh, and you know, even things I'm thinking of now, in terms of the, the further implementation of the Mental Capacity Act, for example, that's a new thing which didn't exist a few years ago, and that, again, I think uh, the workforce review that we're doing at the moment will need to reflect that as well. Yeah, and I should have properly declared that I have worked myself as a social worker, so I do, <laughs> I do fully understand the difficulty, but also the, the lost opportunity in not having social workers and many of the other professionals working to the top of their ability yeah. and their experience and all of that. I think that's having a, an impact across the board. And finally then, in relation to the, the work permit scheme and the thresholds have been set in that. What assessment have you done on the impact that's going to have on our domiciliary care workforce and any other elements, or what impact are you planning to carry out? Sure. Um, so, again, we're, we're in the early stages of this. is the UK government's yep. migration. We're in the early stages of, of assessing that. Um, again, th th there are a number of, of pieces of that which are, are going to be of concern to us. One, I think, is the, is the, the salary threshold. Um, that was announced. We're going to need to assess what that means for us. Um, I think at the moment it's 26, 25,600 in, as envisaged in the in the, the strategy or in the in the UK government's uh, policy, and that sort of would kick in at around the mid, bottom middle end of band five um, for, on agenda for change. Um, I think the initial assessment is that. Um, whilst, uh, and this is at the UK level, we haven't done a, 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 haven't f completed our local uh, considerations yet. At the UK level, I um, I recall I think the Migration Advisory Committee, and apologies if I'm misquoting that, but they had said that their feeling was the policy may be helpful to health, but may um, may not be so helpful to social care, um, just the way it has been. Uh, um, uh, announced anyway but I mean we're in the early stages yet I haven't done a full assessment and I wouldn't want to be speaking outside my brief until fir firmer on the ground. Well given given that there's already a crisis in social care and we are seeing people in hospital who shouldn't be there they, they should be back at home or they are being brought into hospital and they should have been maintained at home um, can I ask what plans you have to challenge that with with the government to say this is creating this will exacerbate what is already a crisis here for us? 
again, we have regular contacts through. We go through the executive office to have our, I think, contacts on at this on, on this issue. Um, so, w once we've fully assessed the policy uh, and the implications of the policy, uh, certainly we do have opportunities to to feedback. In terms of challenge, I suppose, um, whilst, whilst we can say give our assessment of the policy. I think in terms of wider challenge, that then becomes a, more of a political matter than one for civil servants. But certainly, we will be uh, in a position to give the, our, our take on the advice. And when will you have that assessment completed, Andrew? can't say off the top of my head, but we would be hopeful of it being soon. I can certainly firm that up to you in writing, if that would be helpful. Okay. Chair, can I just make a comment on that? Because it is not just employees under the threshold. The implications uh, will ripple up through if, if the, all that underpinning workforce is going to be in any way um, depleted. There will be huge implications across, and, and I hope it is a very wide um, assessment that is cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will be. Um, again, I think we have a lot of the right people already on speed dial, as it were, because it's a lot of the same people who have helped us on the, the EU exit work who will be able to help us in relation to that. I mean, we have some um, extremely um, helpful <coughs> colleagues from the Northern Ireland Social Care Council um, sitting on that group who have been of great assistance on the EU exit um, preparation stuff, and uh, I think they will also be of assistance uh, with, on this work as well. But early days, and again, I, I, if I have um, <coughs> accurately portrayed the, the Migration Advisory Committee view of the world, then apologies for that. But that, I think, was my understanding of something I read recently. Okay. okay um, thank you for your presentations and for the papers which you, which you sent through to us in advance. And uh, thank you for briefing the committee. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, members. We are now moving on to the additional agenda item, SL1. Public Health Notifiable Diseases Order NA 2020. I refer members to pages 43 to 66 of the table papers. Can I advise members that the Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to make illness arising from coronavirus a notifiable disease? The order is proposed to come into operation on the 29th of February 2020 and is subject to negative resolution. Given the urgent nature of the statutory rule, an official is here today to brief the committee and answer any questions members may have. So, can I now welcome Mr. Nigel McMahon? So, welcome, Mr. Nigel McMahon, Chief Environmental Health Officer, Department of Health. So, Nigel, go ahead and brief the committee, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as the Chair said, I'm Nigel McMahon. I'm the Chief Environmental Health Officer in the Department of Health. And first of all, I'd just like to sincerely thank the committee for the opportunity to uh, uh, look at this statutory rule at very short notice this afternoon. I know we have a very busy agenda. Um, these are exceptional times, and the committee will be well aware of the challenges being faced as a result of the spread of coronavirus disease, now known as COVID-19 to an increasing number of countries uh, around the world. It is a rapidly evolving situation, as I am sure you are aware, and the Department is seeking to take all necessary steps to minimise the risk to the public. The proposed statutory rule uh, for consideration this afternoon, the Public Health Notifiable Diseases Order Northern Ireland 2020, would extend the list of notifiable diseases specified in Schedule 1 to the Public Health Act Northern Ireland 1967 to include coronavirus disease COVID-19. The existing schedule of notifiable diseases includes some 33 diseases that are listed, running alphabetically from acute bacterial meningitis through to yellow fever, and it includes some relatively common illnesses such as chickenpox and food poisoning. The primary effect of making COVID-19 disease notifiable under the 67 Act is to require medical practitioners to share patient information with the public health agency if they become aware or have reasonable grounds for suspecting that a person they are attending has coronavirus disease COVID-19. This should also remove any uncertainties that there may be about the legalities of sharing such information under those circumstances. 
In turn, this information will be vital in alerting the public health agency to cases or suspected cases of COVID-19 to ensure that the health and social care system as a whole can quickly respond and for surveillance and tracking of the spread and the epidemiology of the disease should we get cases here in Northern Ireland. <coughs> Most people, I'm sure you'd agree, who believe or advise that they may have or may have been exposed to an infectious disease will be willing to follow medical advice in terms of subjecting themselves to medical examination and diagnostic tests and to allow themselves to be admitted to hospital for treatment should that be deemed necessary. In such cases, it's unlikely that uh, somebody who is ill would attend school or go to work. But in relation to notifiable disease uh, or a notifiable disease, the Public Health Act, Northern Ireland 1967, does provide additional powers which would, under certain circumstances, allow the Public Health Agency to seek an order from a district judge to require a person to undergo medical investigation or to be removed to hospital and, if necessary, detained there for a specified period. These powers have uh, always been available in respect of all the existing notifiable diseases for some decades since the 67 Act uh, was first introduced. However, they very rarely have ever been called upon. It's uh, also an offence under the Act for a person who knows they're suffering from a notifiable disease to go to work. The Public Health Agency may also serve a, a notice on a person excluding them from attending work, children from attending certain places of entertainment, or on a person caring for a child, directing them that the child should not attend school for a period. There are a range of additional measures in the Act relating to things like uh, disinfection of workplaces and hotel rooms, houses and caravans and so on, laundry and uh, uh, library books. Um, and there are also requirements relating to the handling of the body of a person who dies from a notifiable disease. The Republic of Ireland made COVID-19 a notifiable disease by introducing the Infectious Diseases Amendment Regulations 2020 on the 20th of February 2020. Coronavirus disease COVID-19 was made a notifiable disease in Scotland under the Public Health Scotland Act 2008 on the 22nd of February 2020, and similar amendments are currently being considered by England. In terms of next steps then, uh, subject to the Committee's approval, the rule together with the explanatory memorandum will be laid at the Assembly Business Office and the Business Office will submit copies to the Assembly. It's currently planned to bring the order into operation on Saturday the 29th of February 2020. The Department is conscious that this is a rapidly evolving global situation uh, regarding the spread of coronavirus disease. And it's unfortunate that, that has meant there's been insufficient time to consult with the committee and other interested parties uh, in the way in which we would have liked. The designation of coronavirus disease, COVID-19, as a notifiable disease will be part of a wide range of measures intended to support efforts to protect the people of Northern Ireland by seeking to contain the spread of coronavirus disease, COVID-19, should we have cases confirmed here. I'd just like to uh, thank the committee once again for uh, facilitating this request to have the matter considered today. I'm happy to take your views on the proposal and any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Um, when these powers, and, and I recognise the fact that there have been many conditions or diseases or, that have been within this, but when would you be expecting that these powers would be used, or how would they be used? Um, in relation to the, the, the primary effect, which is a, a notification, then that would come into force um, straight away, um, which is why we're keen to get this on the books as soon as possible. That's not to say that notification isn't happening at the moment, um, but it'd be good to have the legislative underpinning for this um, and to help raise awareness, I guess, by, um, by introducing this, that, uh, that that is in fact now a legal requirement to do that, to share that information. Um, the, the statutory rule we're looking at now, of course, doesn't do anything other than add co COVID-19 to the list, um, but I thought it was important that the committee was aware of the other powers available in the Parent Act. Um, as I said in, in the, uh, the, the opening lines, um, those powers, to my knowledge, have not been used. Um, they were a matter of last resort. Um, most people you would expect would comply with medical advice. Um, or possibly even the, the, the threat of, of, uh, of further legal action, I think it's extremely unlikely that the powers would actually be, those additional powers in the Act would actually be used. Okay. 
And in relation to the European surveillance system, um, I don't, my understanding is that that hasn't included COVID-19 as part of it, but would the effect of us making this notifiable here, would that mean we'd be feeding that into the European surveillance system? Um, I don't actually know the answer to that, Chair. If that's something you'd like us to check and get back to you, we can, we can do that. Um, yeah. this, this would purely be uh, domestic legislation in terms of requiring local notification to the PHA. Okay, and then finally from me, before I go to members, um, there's a range of sort of issues that, that could be that could be dealt with, such as access to school, um, you know, access to leisure centre, but is this generally something that would be used in a staged or a phased way, or, or how does it get implemented in a, in a specific case? Um, there are different requirements for different parts of the, the legislation in terms of seeking these orders. But in terms of checks and balances, the PHA, in general terms, the PHA would have to go to a district judge to request that such an order be made. And in terms of evidence, again, there's a variation between the different sections, but broadly speaking, um, the ev evidence to support the making of an order would have to come from the Director of Public Health in the Public Health Agency. Um, they would have to state that they felt that the person either had the disease or was likely to be carrying the disease and that whatever action was proposed was uh, in, in, uh, in the interest of the person, possibly their family or the wider public, for the judge to make that decision. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think there is a, there is a recognition that, and, and I think it's, it's very relevant that uh, it's been brought in, in in the South, because I know the department and the minister are in regular contact, and the fact we live on an island, it's very important, I believe, that we have a joined-up approach in that sense, and that we're, we're a working with the same advice and that there's clear and consistent advice being given to the public in a timely way. Alan? I just want to confirm uh, that the, uh, this new statutory rule only comes into play when somebody has been clinically confirmed to have the disease. If someone was just suspected or was going through uh, the process of, of having it confirmed, does that act come into play at that point, or does it have to be clinically confirmed before okay. the act comes well, in? The, the, the statutory rule we're considering today merely adds COVID-19 to the list. Um, in terms of the wider powers of the act, um, effectively the person would need to be, would need to be uh, uh, ill, or at least the, the medical practitioner would need to have evidence to suggest that they were, maybe a presumptive test or something like that, but they would need to have um, reason to believe that they were infected with the disease. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. It's just um, sort of elaborating on your point about the European model, whether you know, if we um, add this on and it is um, a matter of record, then if it is it the same then with the South, if you have a recordable um, appearance of an illness, do you share that data? With public health in South, I'm just thinking of border regions or people who have travelled across the island. Yeah. How fluid is the share of information? Well, the two departments are in touch with each other. So, in terms of uh, yeah, if either jurisdiction was to get cases, mm. then I think there'll be information shared. I would imagine. Obviously, we haven't we're not in that scenario yet. In terms of cases, I don't think uh, details of individuals would be shared. You know, for for obvious reasons. I suppose I'm trying to understand at what stage GDPR overrides this, or it overrides, you know, the other, um, because there is there is a vested interest in understanding an individual's maybe connections in the instance of a diagnosis, and I'm not talking about Absolutely. you know reasonableness of um, yeah. judging that they may have, but if a diagnosis was made. If diagnosis is made, then the public health agency would engage in their normal contact tracing that they do. So they would in, in, interview the person, investigate the, uh, the, where they have been, who they've been in close yeah. contact with, and take details from those people. Um, if they're cross-border movement, then um, it may well be appropriate you know, to share that information um, with the other jurisdiction. Thank you. Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. And just to clarify, is the part of detention in the Act as a whole, or is it contained in the statutory rule as well? It's, it's in the main 1967 Act. It has always, it has always been there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the statutory rule is same, simply adds COVID-19 to the list of diseases to which the Act applies. Okay. 
so therefore it would extend to COVID-19 if the SR is accepted. Yes, um, yes. Okay, um, I mean obviously it's, it's, it's very sort of serious and important, but I mean is, is there concerns that, I mean I think you say the reason to believe if there's a general practitioner or a other health professional has reason to believe that somebody could have the, the virus, I mean is that a document, is that a, an investigation or, or how does that kind of come to pass so to speak? Um, well, I have to say I'm not a medical doctor, um, so it's difficult for me to, to answer that question. But uh, I mean, one scenario I could give you might be is if, a, if an initial test, um, laboratory test, was a was a presumptive test, you know, subject to a further test to confirm, then the attending doctor might feel that was sufficient evidence to assume uh, for the time being that the person did in fact have the illness. Mm. Uh, just quickly, sure, if I can, is there? Uh, I mean, I know we had a briefing around the. Mental Capacity Act, and there were some suggestions about uh, potential human rights challenges. It was a court case in England. I mean, is there? I mean, public health is obviously fundamental and a priority in terms of uh, containing the virus. But is there a concern from a human rights perspective that this could be potentially abused, or is that being suggested or uh, investigated by the department? Well, I suppose the first thing I would say is that uh, we're, we're we're not aware that it has been used in in the past. Um, and we would deem it very unlikely that it would be used in this scenario. It's obviously important for the committee to know that it's, that it's there. In terms of the wider issues uh, uh, and the issues that you raise around human rights, I mean, the, 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 the jurisdictions across the UK and in the South are all talking to each other about this. There are obviously different legislative landscapes, particularly since devolution, uh, uh, in, in all the countries. Um, so what we're seeking to do is take a consistent approach w where that's possible, of course. but. Um, we're trying to sort of iron out these differences, if you like, in terms of the legislation. Ours being 1967, as you say, precedes you know, much of the, the modern sort of human rights legislation. Um, and it's probably fair to say if you were rewriting it again now, it might look slightly different. Um, but there are certain checks and balances built into it. Um, and and you know, we would be confident it would be applied, if ever, um, appropriately. Okay. Okay, members, content. Okay, Nigel, thank you for your your assistance, um, and we can let you go now. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So, are our members then content that uh, our members content that the department makes the statutory rule? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So, moving on then to SL one, <coughs> the recovery of. Health Service Charges Amounts Amendment Regulations NA 2020. I refer members to pages 115 to 118 of the pack. Can I advise members that the Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to apply an inflationary uplift to the current tariff levels used for the collection of costs incurred by hospitals when treating casualties of road traffic accidents? The order will come into operation on the 1st of April 2020 and is subject to negative resolution. So are members content with the Department of Mexico statutory? Sure. Can I just ask, um, it says in, on page 115 that a similar scheme operates in GV, but do we know anything about what operates in 26 counties? I don't think it's included. I didn't see anything. No, in the I didn't see anything that. mentioned. And obviously, we're the one island, so things can happen across borders. So I'm just wondering, could we get any more information on that? Can we get an update on that and we can defer it. Yeah. Chair, can I also make the point, I think we all get a little bit, when you hear a similar scheme, what is dissimilar? What part is missing or has been changed mm. in Northern Ireland? So while we're doing that investigatory yeah. work, it might be worth comparing what's missing. Yeah. Right. So we'll, we'll seek that further information and come back then. Okay, thank you. So moving on to correspondence then. Um, turning to correspondence, can I ask members to refer to pages 120 to 153 of the pack and pages 40 to 41 of the table papers? Are members content with the proposed actions as noted in the correspondence memo at pages 120 to 121 of the pack and to note the Minister's statement in table papers? Members yes. content? Thank you. In, ter in terms of the forward work programme, then, can I refer members to the draft forward work programme in table papers at pages 155 to 156? Uh, can I highlight specifically the committee's planning day on 19th of March in Dungannon 
and just encourage all members to confirm your attendance with the committee office, please. Thank you. Are members content to note the forward work programme? Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other business, Andrew? Members of any other business for today? Chair, could I just ask that um, that you use your role as chair of the committee to just um, reinforce the message coming out from the public health agency on advice that people should use if they have concerns around coronavirus? Yeah, I think that's as members content. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, Chair, yes, just to agree with uh, Sinead on that. Um, and also, the um, subject of um, organ donation was raised again, certainly with me this week, and I know there's been a bit of a public debate around it. Um, just to confirm that the committee has um, asked for an update on, yeah. on what, the, well, what the department has done since yes. it was last discussed at this committee. Uh, I presume it was 2016. Yeah. And I think I think in, in general we are waiting on a number of responses. I think yeah. we should we should maybe just uh, follow up on a few of those and ask that those be, be got. Um, okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so, date, time, and place of next meeting. Then the next meeting will take place at 10:30 a.m. on Thursday, 5th of March, 2020, here in the Senate Chamber in Parliament Building. Thank you, members. Thanks. It is closed.